So, uh, our next speakers, Jean-Marie and Aaron, are going to talk about uh, Scotch tape and Flash ROM and the way of the UEFI. And enjoy the talk. Big round of applause, please. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you can hear, I'm French. So, how many French people in the room? <laughs> so, I, at least two people might be able to understand me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, sorry for the accent. Um, so, um, I'm working for a company called IT Renew, uh, and um, I, was, I was leading uh, Horizon Computing, but we have been acquired back in June. Um, our job is to design open hardware servers, and uh, we, we are reselling recertified hardware and new hardware. We are trying to expand the life cycles of the, of the machines. And we are deeply involved into the Linux boot projects because we, we want to get rid of the AMI system BIOS, which are aging on these machines. So um, that talk is not about who I am, but it's more about that I'm sharing with Arun since a couple of months. So we met, I think, uh, in six months ago or three months ago, just before summer. So we are back to school, so it's, uh, it was in March, more six months ago. And uh, Arun is, um, is new to system BIOS development and uh, discovered the joy of, uh, <laughs> uh, of uh, running testing with uh, low-level firmware development. And uh, the, the story about the scotch tape is more what kind of hint we could provide to Arun on how to upgrade the firmware on a Winter Fellow CP server. And what you should know is that even if this is an open hardware machine, there is no spy header on this machine. So it has to re remove the, 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 the flash chip from the, from the socket and find a way to remove it in an easy way without hav having any tools. So we told him, just use some scotch tape and, and, <laughs> and unglue the chip and re re replace it by using the scotch tape from the single fingers. So this is, this is just the, the bag idea uh, of uh, how that stuff works. So when Arun came to, uh, to me and asking me, uh, I want to develop a new, a new way to test the security of system BIOS, and this is what his company is currently doing. So he's working for a startup, and he will, d deeply, he, he will explain to you just later on what he's, um, he's doing. Um, he asked me for a development platform, and, um, and he joined the Linux boot community um, where Tram sits either, uh, yeah, I think, uh, four months ago. And uh, we send him our development platform, which is uh, the Winterfell machine that you can see on the right-hand side. And uh, he needed a couple of tools from flash ROMs to DDProc Programmer, Debug Custom Cards, Power Supply, Serial Communications, the nodes, and uh, understanding how that stuff works. So when you came from software, that's a lot of things. And there is another issue when you work for a startup, which is uh, you mostly work from home. And that stuff is not really woman compliant, especially when you are married. And if you are <laughs> married with a French woman, that's, that's even tougher. And this is the case of Arun, so by the way. <laughs> so I, I understand the pain that he faced during summer <laughs> with that development board. So, and uh, we started to work together to find, uh, to find some options to enhance the development platform and find a way to automatize the, the testing. And that's uh, part of the Linux boot CI that I'm going to introduce tomorrow afternoon, so during a, a, a longer talk. So I'm just introducing the, the rough ID that we had uh, around this, uh, this platform. So the, the, the main goal um, of Arun is to, is to test at scale security of, Linux, uh, of um, system BIOS images at scale. So it means that is looking and seeking for as many system BIOS images that it could get from end users and try to identify any malware, virus, or any th everything which could go wrong with this image. So when you think about it, there is millions of systems in the field. And how can we test that at scale? So we probably cannot test that with this kind of technology. And, and we started to work together on finding a way to um, have something which could scale. So we, we developed uh, from the winter fall um, a cloud-based operation. So saying that um, instead of having the servers within your bedroom or your living room so, and, uh, and replacing the BIOS chips, we should find a way to SSH to a platform and using an API and submit a firmware image, start the machine, and get feedback on the status of basic testings. Like, does the, does the machine has been able to boot? Is it able to boot an operating systems? 
and can we identify any um, any specific issues from the uh, from the behavior of the platform? So we we don't need any more to swap the chip. So we are using uh, some flash emulators and uh, various ways to manage that. We develop a web API, and Arun is now able with his team to get connection directly to uh, servers in data centers and testing firmware as, as much as he wants. And, uh, and roughly, we are working with the Linux boot team right now to integrate that stuff with our GitHub account and getting a continuous integration platform, which from every commit, we can check if the firmware generated is able to boot the machine and if, uh, if, it's, um, if the new features is working properly or not on live hardware. So that's, that's the main goal. So our own tool is called the Armor Analyzers. And as I said, it's, co it's collecting image, and you, you can go on the uh, prototypes on these websites, which is harmor.ai slash scan. So you can upload firmware there and get uh, straightforward feedbacks on your uh, firmware integrity and, uh, and get analysis. Um, just to give you um, the, the behavior of the winter thunder that we virtualized to remove the scotch tape, so. We, we got the spy flash emulator, so there is a hardware hack for that. So we, we had to remove the, SO, uh, the, the chip the header from the motherboard, so we removed that with a Dremel. So that's a, uh, it's not a dangerous hack, but that's a tricky thing to do. So you can kill the motherboard if you, <laughs> if you do it the wrong way. But, uh, and then we soldered down uh, some pin headers, and we got, we got the emulators, and, and through the API currently you can stop the emulator, start it, and upload a new firmware image and run, the, and run the software. And you can power on and off the, uh, the servers, so just in case your, so, uh, your firmware is breaking the node, so which could happen. And roughly it's happening more, uh, more often than uh, it is working. So yeah. uh, that's, uh, <coughs> that's the thing. And, uh, and we are currently using that, uh, that approach for both projects, either Linux boot or our own project. So that's the, that's the other thing. Just to show you. It's not a demo, but uh, okay, my internet connection died. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a demo. <laughs> so I was connected to the servers and get get access to the firmware, but it's dead. So I hope it will work tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> uh, the thing is, with that technology, you can be everywhere around the world. You get access to data centers, and you get you can get access to the firmware level. Uh, of you can the, show the, the video. Um, yeah, we'll we'll do that a little bit later. So Aaron now is going to introduce you uh, his own work on how he can uh, use that technology to enhance uh, his security stack and scale it at some um, testing hundreds of firmware instead of one by one. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I got involved around six months ago uh, with, the, with the project. Um, our aim was to primarily, uh, my background is in endpoint security, so basically malware, anti-malware, so things like Bromium, and that's my world, the world from where I came from. Firmware has started to become an increasingly important idea to the point where a lot of the endpoint security research is now shifting its attention towards uh, uh, you know, tackling things like the BIOS. So just going back up a, a few slides, um, the miscellaneous tool sets that are referenced there is of import. So currently, if you want to do serious analysis, you'll have to kind of find your own way to unpack a said ROM, uh, or you might have to source it from you know, different types of websites and places where sometimes you have encountered manufacturer websites where it's just like an open blob where there's not a proper reference of where the original is coming from or where the comparative firmware uh, can be analyzed either. So it's a bit of a wild west at the moment. Um, our focus is trying to develop a system which can accept a, any firmware. So we started out with UFI ROMs and things like that, but now we have people sending us um, router firmware, a news segment is video firmware, bunches of things like that. So 
with John Murray's system, the advantage there is that you can start to instrument dynamic analysis as well, aside from the normal static stuff, which uh, you know we do. Um, so I am a bit bummed that uh, he was not able to show that off because that would be really interesting. And one of the core things that we did was to also take a look at um, what's the advantage of running Linux boot versus, say, a stock AMI that came on the Winterfell. So we used the standard in that, which is chipsec. And today morning, I heard that uh, the boot time differences. And it, it appears that even for testing uh, from a security point of view, Linux boot does a bit better. And this is with no particular enhancements. So these are like comments directly from Tremel and Ron uh, with regards to that effort. Um, so with that, what happens is we started to develop a small system where we could accept a ROM BIOS image and then unpack all, all of the constituent portable executables so we have all these manufacturers um, that uh, we have now had a database on. And I think this is off by probably 30 to 40 in the past 40 hours. And we, since we come from the anti-malware space, we have you know, sets, set of static rules that can trigger on all these EXEs. So it's been a bit fun because we are seeing a lot of smoke. And uh, it is a bit scary. And this is just using static analyzers. And the real aim is to go to the point where we would be able to work with um, Jean-Marie's system where we could start to dynamically instrument uh, if he's in execution and all. Do you want to speak a bit about that? Well, it's up to you. So this is your software, so. Yeah, no, no. For your part where y using your um, infrastructure, you could actually see things in execution as well. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. So when, when we are running on live hardware, you can do whatever you want. So you can instrument the, the firmware and you can get feedback directly. And we, we mostly use that infrastructure. That's because at the early stage of the Linux boot project, we faced um, issues to boot up uh, various Linux distro. So there, there was some kernel tweaking which were required and uh, the installer uh, we are not working properly on the Linux boot machines, and we, we decided to integrate uh, a full CI and re rebuild uh, Red Hat, CentOS, and hold the distro to check if they could be working on Linux boot or not straight, straight out of out the box. And when we looked at the combination, we said, okay, that's going to be a nightmare if we try to do it by hand, and we need, we need, we need it to scale. So we are able to Roughly, we are able to uh, emulate any kind of uh, production environment with the current infrastructures. Yep. So we, we got, um, I th right now the backend is about 100 servers, so on, only 20 are usable for the firmware analysis, but 80 of them are, are usable for stressing the, the, the machine which are under testing. So the implications for us is we have done a bunch of work where We've used normal static techniques, and we started to find some really crazy stuff. So this happened in the past two weeks. Um, the last two parts, the first ones, we've been studying for a while. So there was a well-documented case of a rootkit on a Lenovo in 2015. And what we have found since then is we've almost identified four that happened on top of what they, you know, what they got caught. And uh, so that's a bit concerning. Um, the more funny thing is when you look at even modern systems, like these two submissions came from, one was from the US, the other one was from Italy. Both of them are fairly recent systems. One is a Alienware machine that's 2017, it's a high-end system, and a Razer, which is also kind of a high-end gaming system. I don't own any of these machines. These are people submitting their ROMs for analysis. Both of these machines, we would find this is an actual cert that is in the production firmware of this machine with caps lock, do not trust AMI test PK. I kid you not, see? So I think you get the picture. And so we're not you know, using any kind of very sophisticated things at this point. Even with that, um, this is the situation. Um, so 
it is a bit scary. Uh, and going back to those stats, uh, I can only speak things in aggregate because as our customers have stepped up, we we have been advised that we can't talk about certain things. So it, on an aggregate, we have almost you know, gotten near about 200,000 EXCs that are of particular interest. Now, these are not necessarily malicious. They might be even some things which are not you know, following proper security hygiene, or they're um, just doing something that wasn't um, you know, part of the spec. Uh, and so it's really interesting for us is that this is just static. It's not even dynamic instrumentation at this point. And to see this picture is pretty scary. Um, then we come to <coughs> the non-BIOS or UFI firmware submissions that uh, is particularly entertaining because some of them contain entire Linux distributions, uh, default passwords, uh, buggy web apps, and things like that. Uh, we started to have more and more uh, submissions that are not really BIOS or UFI. And we now have been engaged to start developing a methodology by which we could, you know, tackle things like, you know, supply chain compromise. We also started to take a, get a lot of video ROMs. Um, none of these things are having particularly high level of scrutiny at this point in time, where um, it is a bit interesting for myself because my world was restricted to tops ring minus one till six or eight months ago. So this is a whole world in, in, in many ways that doesn't have any security uh, overview or what you would call oversight. Um, and so we could look at some of the ways by which you could do this today is you have to first um, take a machine and get it to the point where you can get its firmware. So you'd have to do that differently depending on the machine. So if you want to do an extraction from Windows, it's slightly different to a Mac. Uh, there are tools like Flash ROM. But all of these have a constraint where, you know, in a way, you're kind of forced to trust an untrusted system where it could all already be messed up, right? So at that point, you really would want to have a third party um, or a trusted system that you built out. Um, so that's, again, one more point where Jean-Marie's efforts could come in handy, where you know, we would have a certain guarantee that we are not locked into like that. Yeah, that's the, 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 the thing else. I started to work back in the firmware industry about 18 months ago, and um, I didn't work with, with, within the, that industry for about 15 years. So my background is a chip designer, and uh, then after I diverged uh, to other tasks. And, uh, and I was amazed that 15 years later, we were using the same kind of tools to test this software. So nothing changed in 15 years. Why I was looking at Linux and uh, how the software developments change, and everything has changed from C CVS to SVN to Git and all that things, and, and, and the way we are testing software at scale. And um, we started uh, with our small engineering team to think that Sec firmware security is a strong issue, especially when we are recertifi recertifying servers because we are getting servers which are two to three years old without any firmware updates. So EME system BIOS, no longer supported by ODMs. The machine is still up and running and can, can last for um, the next couple of years. Um, so two options, either we scrap the motherboard because there is security issues or we find ways to keep these boards up and running. So that's, that's why we started to work on Linux boot. But th this was not fixing one of the major issues. How can we test Linux boots? Even if I'm trusting Linux, we still can insert, um, I shouldn't say malware, but we can, we can misconfigure uh, the kernel or we can misconfigure the firmware in a way that it's becoming unsecured. And one of the goals that we had by helping um, 
Arun teams uh, is clearly to use the brute force and try to write as many uh, test procedures that we can to try to hack and, 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 and kill uh, Linux boot on the OCP servers and check if everything works. So that's why we try to scale um, the, the testing platforms to a number of nodes and, and, and getting as many tests written down. So right now, the whole testing platform is open source. So you can contribute to the uh, testing infrastructure. This is within the Linux boot repo. And um, the tests that we are running are not yet open source. That's not a wish from our side. This is just a, uh, because we are lacking bandwidth, uh, human, human resource bandwidth. And we're, we are currently hiring resources. So this should be fixed in Q1 2019. So new engineers are joining the team. And you will see coming up a lot of testing procedures. Uh, for Linux boot firmware, but I think we, you should be able to test, to use the same process for other firmware based like UEFI because UEFI is also supported on, uh, on OCP nodes. So what, what we try to introduce is really a different way to think about how testing uh, firmware from features and security perspective and then apply the same rules that everybody knows uh, within the software development industry. And th this is easing the task to hire new engineers to work on these kind of subjects. So because when we started to hire people, they, they were complaining about the fact that they don't know anything about firmware and they don't want to learn because the tools are so different from what they know that they, they, they didn't want to take the time to learn new tools which are really dedicated to a very specific uh, to a very specific work. So, and that's why we said, okay, we need to open up the platform and, and it should be as, as open as we can. And that's, uh, that's the, the current goal. So I'm gonna swap my machine over so that we can start to see some details. So one of the current things that you can, you can look at is when you wanna analyze firmware today, depending on the type of firmware, you have to have the image collection down, which currently has a few ways of going about it. In the modern MacBooks around after 2017 or something, you have a nice little tool called IfyCheck, which allows you to dump the ROM, and then you can sort of straight away upload that. For other systems, you can use flash ROM. There's also an option in ChipSec where you can dump, um, dump the ROM. So once you get that done, you have certain options, which is you can use something like BinWalk, and other tools like UFI parser and so on and so forth to kind of sp split that image and then start drilling down into the um, individual items. What's really interesting for us from the security perspective is currently, I think these static heuristics around firmware analysis is very nascent stage to the point where we are pretty much all of the innovation in the field seems to be taking what we know to be working in the anti-malware game and trying to apply it into the firmware space. So you could quickly check for a hash and, and see if that comes up on one of the antivirus scans and things like that. But if, if we look at it objectively, it is pretty scary to see that unless you're able to instrument it and see it executing in the actual context and in the actual system, there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of certainty that what you're seeing is, is the reality. So that's a pretty scary deal. Second, taking a bunch of heuristics that's worked in the normal anti-malware space and directly deploying it into this thing is kind of misinformed in my humble opinion because it's going to lead you into you know, a ton of false positives and things like that. So the funny thing for us is even though we have a sort of a funnel to try and isolate, um, based on just the corner cases that we have seen in the past few months, uh, just looking at the Lenovo rootkit, all of those things are out, out of the window because we have seen in some of the other variants, none of the AVs pick it up. So we are back to kind of square one where we'd have to kind of manually certify. That's why having the real system and being able to to see it execute is, is vastly important. So it is possible to construct a system using only open source effort. I think just a couple of weeks ago, there was a release by a group that's supported by the German government called FactRE. Um, 
so you could build your own rig where you can use things like Binwalk, write up your own Yara signatures, write up all your own ClamAV stuff, and, and then deploy it on a particular firmware. But in our opinion, we need to have a central source of ground truth, and I, it's not clear to me whether that is going to be a viable thing just using the open source model, because a lot of the manufacturers have their own uh, what you would call motivations in the space. So in our own case, we are now starting to see that some of our customers have certain you know, parameters, like we, we may not disclose some of the things that they have, right? So yes, it is possible to construct everything using open source tooling, but I, you know, having that central ground truth repository is going to be a challenge in, in my view. At least I have struggled with it to find something that's out there that gives you an easy way to just go and check. So that's part of the reason why we've started to go down that track. And, and the other complexity comes along where we have firmware for which there, there is not a lot of scrutiny at this point in time, like your routers and, and printer firmware. Like we have another friend group who just found out a bug in, in the Epson firmware. So how do you make a single source of truth for all these different uh, things? And then how do you reorganize the static techniques that we've had in the normal anti-malware game to sort of work with this new space. So with that, um, you know, we have things where you could, you could, you know, take a look at all those tools, or you could use something like Armor and take a look at, um, let's say, let's take a look at a submission that was done. So the idea is simple. You just go and go to your firmware, and you just pick it up, and you hit open. Hopefully, this is connected to the network. <laughs> and then you just hit a button. Uh, it is saying uploading in my status bar, but I don't think you can see it in that screen there. There you go. So the idea is to have for any sort of firmware a simple tool like this where you can choose the file, plop it in, and then it gives you the analysis. So in this case, you can have a bunch of stuff that gets you started off on the right track. And at a glance, we can start looking at you know, the total number of executables found. The executables of interest right now, as I said, is not accurate in my view because we are just retrofitting a lot of the techniques that we used in the normal AV game. I think a lot more bad stuff will be found once uh, Jean-Marie's uh, infrastructure and our efforts in that area are going to get more mature. Um, and this, I think, is that famous place where you could look at my... Yeah, there you go. So that's a cert that literally says, do not trust. And it's also expired. So this is from a production machine that is released this year. Uh, and this is the state. This is not an old machine. This is 2018. So this is where we stand at this point in time with, uh, with all of this. So it is a bit scary. For me, I was frankly gobsmacked because I didn't think this sort of a thing could be possible coming in from the world of bowel ring minus one. Um, we have had a router firmware where we were able to give our clients everything from default passwords to you know, exploitable web front ends that they weren't aware of, uh, things like that. So for us, the goal is to not have me sit down with um, scotch tape and a huge machine and be you know, forced to do that because it can't scale. You just can't do that with thousands of, you need to have everything programmatic. That's why I'm excited by the fact that Jean-Marie's team is gonna work on an actual API. 
Um, which, yeah, which and would... if you want to know more about the API, you have to come to my talk tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> so yes. I'm just advertising it. So, but the thing is, all of this works is uh, is done by com that's community driven. So if you want to participate to the API and provide feedbacks and and all these things, so everything will stay open source forever. So that's the that's that's really key to us. And um, even the platform and the hardware platform uh, that we are deploying is, um, is currently open source. So we are still using a couple of uh, proprietary components. We have no choice for some of them. But we are trying to enhance <coughs> all of this. So this is just the beginning of the story. And um, I really think what is key is just to bring the firmware software industry into a new century. because. You know, last time I was in Taiwan, I was shocked by the way they were testing their firmware. That somebody was <laughs> entering the EMI menu and just clicking, uh, activating features and rebooting and saying, okay, it works, it doesn't work, and checking a piece of paper. <laughs> uh, and I said, okay, I think the, uh, most of the mistakes are purely coming from the human who is running the test all day long. And that's, that's not his or her fault. That's because this is a super boring job. And you can miss some tasks, so that's the thing. And, uh, and the only one way to test that properly is just to automatize as much as we can. So that's, that's the current goal of the project, and this is what we're doing with our own. So even from our point of view, <coughs> as we go down further this rabbit hole, the idea is um, when we expand human analysis on a singular firmware, we don't want to keep doing that. We want to only tackle what would be changing or difference, and all of that is not possible unless you have the whole thing end-to-end -end in one cohesive system. Um, so we are still at the very early days. In our case, uh, you know, we were literally incorporated this year, sort of, so, sort of so it's running at a very breakneck pace. Um, our aim is to open source most of it, except for the stuff that we are not allowed to due to external customer demands and things like that. So, uh, and that's always a challenge because I think one of the things that struck me from the Intel talk today morning is, you know, it is a binary blob at the end of the day that they're giving. So, you know, you, you have that tension of, you know, Ron likes to joke that it's called the golden rule. They who have the gold make the rules. So we can't sort of <laughs> say that we're going to open source everything because um, some of those people will be very upset with us and that would be a company ending exercise for from where we stand at this point in time. So there are a lot of good tool vendors, especially like, if you want to look at even the disassemblers, um, we have a special relationship with um, Binary Ninja. And, uh, uh, and we, we want to push that relationship to the point where we could have some of these things of the dynamic analysis happening also over the web. Um, so the idea is to start to go towards this place where we can have a single firmware security analysis platform that's pretty serious and works well. And, People don't have to kind of burn down their room trying to set up all the equipment, which I did a couple of months ago. So, um, and I, I found great help from bothering Tremel and Ron and everybody on Slack saying, hey, am I going to you know, blow this up? And so you don't want that because you want your engineers to be focused on just getting to the, the meat of it. And you, know, you could potentially do all of this stuff using, using um, ready-made and available techniques, but I think the challenge is as you continue to go to scale, I would find it hard to believe that as, you know, many different people with different, different databases would be better off than trying to at least have one common ground truth place. Like today, for example, in the security world, we have virus total, right? If you want to do a quick check on a known or bad hash, why do people go there? It's simply because of the fact that it's a known, you know, ground truth state. Um, you know, so I think something like that will happen in the firmware security space because otherwise it's all a one-off analysis, right? So there's not a lot of discipline around uh, instrumenting the space. So yeah, so that's sort of where we stand. I'm certainly not the expert. I'm just amazed that with just little effort, we are able to find out so much that is uh, pretty scary. Um, and, you know, I didn't even have to go somewhere. These were actual submissions made by people on the site. You know, and there's this guy, my, one of my prospects. He said, yeah, don't ever 
tell anyone my name because you know I don't want to get trouble into company X, right? So they, <laughs> so it is a it's a fun state to be in. Um, but yeah, this is sort of where we are at this point, and I, we are I looking agree. for I help. Think, I think that's that's probably time for a question. If you have here, some of them, who want to start? We have one at the back and one at the front, so. <laughs> That would be the Thanks uh, for the talk, it was interesting. Um, just a couple of things. One comment is, having worked with various BIOS manufacturers, uh, IBM here, uh, I am totally not surprised. Um, secondly, on, on power systems these days, we do have CI for the firmware, and the way we do it, and I don't know whether that's applicable on X86 or not, because I don't know how you boot an X86 uh, processor, is uh, we actually provide the system ROM image from the BMC. And it's effectively, the BMC can source it from anywhere and put it in RAM somewhere, and make yeah. it look like a, a ROM. So we can uh, HTTP from the BMC a, a different file, put the host, um, uh, measure the host. Okay. Uh, we can also explode the file system of the f uh, as uh, files on the BMC that f virtually reconstitute it like a, a ROM FS. Okay. Uh, so we can replace individual components uh, and NFS mount them from a server that constantly build new binaries, for example. So uh, for I know I know a lot of systems don't have a BMC, but for those who do. Uh, I don't know whether it's possible to do that on x86, but it has been uh, very, very useful to do CI. Okay, that's, that's doable. Um, roughly, it is doable on x86, so we can go through the BMC. Um, one of the challenges I see with that is, uh, first of all, I still know some servers who doesn't have any BMC. Oh, of course, so this, of course. This could if you have one, yeah, and this, you control this. it. <laughs> and the second thing, we are just moving the issue to the BMC in the end, because um, we want to test the global firmware stack on the servers, and um, and uh, then we need to instrument the BMC. So just to be sure, yeah. So roughly, we we are currently working with Open BMC. I'm not a big fan of a super fat complex BMC. I'm sorry to tell you that. So, but um, I'm I'm more a very basic guy who who believes that the server is made to be turned on, stay on, and reset. So that's <laughs> it. And uh, if it doesn't work for a couple of seconds, so it has to be reset. And if after three resets, it doesn't work, so just shut it down. And, and, and don't, don't try to know what's happening on the machine. So, and, uh, and, and, and to me, OpenBMC, or all the BMC firmwares, are inserting new security threats. So that's the, due in some way to these kind of features. Because you can, you can upgrade or you can fake uh, some firmware image from the BMC. So if your BMC is hacked, we have secure boots. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm convinced that there, there is a lot of work which is made on top of that. So but yeah, but you are right, and the BMCs have been a source of problem. In fact, there is hardware features in most BM, common BMC chips out there that allow you to background the BMC from, yeah. uh, from, the, from the host. But to, to answer your question, so on OCP system x86, you get some generation who doesn't have um, a high-end BMC, so they rely on ME chips. So which also sucks because the firmware is totally locked. Uh, but uh, uh, some of them are relying on uh, um, A-speed BMC, so I, I bet that this is the same kind of BMC you are using on the IBM yes. system. So we, we have these kind of features. Uh, we, we try not to using them within the CI. <coughs> That's because uh, we want to be server agnostic. And we thought that the best way to be server agnostic is just to be plugged on the spy bus or the flash bus, and that's it. <coughs> Thank you. You've been talking about um, the firmware submission stuff. Yeah. Okay. You've been talking about the firmware submissions that you've been getting and that you're amazed about what your analysis of those submissions has been finding. But is that information actually finding its way back to the manufacturers? And if so, do they actually learn lessons from that? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a great question. Thank you for asking, <laughs> because I can get started on my soapbox. Um, short answer is, um, well, it, it depends on who is asking them. So if we or some average person ask them, probably they're just going to ignore you. In fact, a top researcher friend of mine tried to find somebody in Epson that he can speak to about an issue that they have found. He was unsuccessful. This is somebody who's 
taught at Black Hat for 10 years, so he's a known entity. And he, you know, frankly failed to get anywhere with that. Um, so the, the quick answer is, what we are doing now is that our customers are scary. So they can possibly cause some change in behavior because they are more scary than two guys with a laptop and a bunch of infrastructure, right? So depends on who is asking. So uh, if you're saying, have you guys seen any instances of behavior modification based on the analysis that we are supplying? Um, we are going to see that happen thanks to our customers, perhaps not due to us, because they have got far more bigger checkbooks and decision-making powers than individual researchers. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight, yeah. Let me maybe um, follow up differently on that. So are you doing any tracking across those reports? Like, for example, are you um, keeping any track of whether an issue that you found in version 1 is also still present in version 2? Yes. So we, we are not just tracking across the uh, same product line. We are also tracking for the similar issues across our ROMs to find out if something's tripping. And the great thing about this field is as we develop a new heuristic, we're going to rerun it on everything that we have to see if we can find out. So yes, that is, we do want to have that constant checking. Uh, that's another place where Jean-Marie's ideas are so useful because it makes it easier for us to create that pipeline where you could quickly check and sort of, you know, make sure that something is not a repeat. Um, I'm forgetting the QA term for it. I don't know. Regression. Yes, regression. regression. So um, the other thing that was a bit amazing is there are whitelists out there in the space where there was an effort by ch the Chipset guys. Um, they had a whitelist for UFI executables that's not been updated since about a year right now. Right. So I have been bothering them in various ways. Um, so right now, I think. The way people think about firmware is another potential barrier because everyone sort of, I think it's like a, some kind of a mind trick that these guys have played where everyone just trusts their hardware. Like they can, it's just funny because you know, you're generally more skeptical about software, but you can't force people to just think the same way about their hardware because even I was to, you know, in that camp at least two years ago, I think my views changed when I had the sudden bug that was disclosed by Intel and it started me thinking that, hey, nothing on my current ring minus one security stack can even check for what's going on here, right? So, uh, so I think part of it's just this mindset about firmware that is really hard to break. Like I, I've spoken to guys like Ron who've been doing it for 30 years. He, he has cr screamed himself to the wall and you know, I think someday it might change. And so right now, uh, our best answer is we, we are working with some customers who are pretty powerful, so maybe they can drive a faster response from some of the manufacturers. The other thing is that I think maybe some of the firmware people are playing with an extremely tight margin. They don't have resources to invest into those kinds of things. I mean, their margin is already under high pressure, so... Maybe there's a good reason for that. It always goes back to, you know, who's making the gold or who's giving the gold, right? So, um, yeah, but hopefully it will change. Hopefully it will start to get more, I don't know, safer. I think, oh, yes. So I see that you also extract information about the TLS certificates. Do you perform some security checks on the TLS certificates? Um, you mean to say for stuff like expiry or... Yeah, also if the, if the uh, modulus is really prime and not just some pseudo prime, something like that? Uh, yeah, that's sort of the next bits on our roadmap where we want to do not just that, but also uh, check out which parts are using which certificates for their attestation and so forth. So... Um, yeah, we, we certainly go and look into that. We, our aim is to be able to just analyze pretty much anything that our customers would want us to go, do, you know, go hunt. Um, so that's sort of the, the track. Okay. I think we have... 
Well, why is that showing red? Is that something that I should be bothered? That's because we are running out of time. Oh, so yes. It's, it's <laughs> not going to explode, don't worry. <laughs> so, very quick one. So um, we mentioned Ben talking about power. Um, what is the status of your platform or architectural coverage? Uh, you can go I think first. This is your platform, the not mine. Wh which <laughs> when you say platform, as in, so, I mean, obviously x86 is pretty right. much the, the main core. Like, are you also looking into I don't know R, MIPS, other things? Uh, we are. Our aim is to be agnostic, so we are accepting submissions from any sort of. Uh, chipsets and firmware manufacturers. So the idea is to be one source where you can submit. Uh, but our focus but right now... tools need to be different, right? Yeah, it will be different. So that's the whole beauty about this is when you are doing it over as a service, you get to make your own decision tree as to how something will be handled. So we are going to have a bit of freedom once we do the initial fast analysis as to how do we go about doing that. Some of the stuff we don't, we are not able to handle because we, we haven't written anything for it just right now. But the aim is to be able to ingest anything and come up with, uh, with, a, with a report on it that says, you know, this is what's funny about it. This is what's uh, strange about it. Um, we started with what we know or what we could learn fast to know. But, you know, over time, I think the game is to map out to arm to any of the, the chip manufacturers and, and go from there. So we, we already have people submitting things like video ROMs and um, stuff like that. So uh, that's the beautiful thing about a web service is that, you know, if somebody uploads something, then you get to decide how to bracket it and, and do that. And I would again call, there's an open source effort right now called FactRE that was sponsored by the German government. Um, and you can also have this kind of a personal testing setup where you could spin up um, a firmware analysis system. But I don't think they have all the different um, tool sets that we, you know, somebody more commercial would be able to leverage because some of the feeds, like John Murray said, aren't, they aren't uh, open source. You know, they're, they're not free. So. All right. Uh, we have you. had it here now. Thanks so much again, Arun Thank and Jean-Marie.